It's been a rough time around Major League Baseball in recent days with prominent starting pitchers dropping like flies due to injury. But have you noticed? Cardinal starter Stephen Matz isn't one of them. Coming up on b Shave Daily. What's going on, everyone? And welcome in to this edition of b Shave Daily. Brendan Schaefer here with you. It is Sunday morning, April 7th, 2024. As of this recording, the Cardinals coming off their win on Saturday over the Marlins to secure the series. Now, can they go for the sweep on Sunday? Will be the question at Bush Stadium. As Kyle Gibson, Gibby, takes on young Max Meyer of the Miami Marlins. Marlins still do not have a win on the season as of this recording. The Cardinals hoping to keep it that way on Sunday. And the Redbirds now 5-4 and four on the young season. Cardinals with a winning record for the first time since April 2nd of last year. If you think back, they won that Toronto Blue Jays series to open the season, two games to one, and then from there, the wheels fell off and never got put back on. But the Cardinals in 2024 have put that behind them and are off to a solid little start here, folks. We'll talk about it coming up on B-Shape Daily, specifically the start by Stephen Matz from Saturday on a day where we find out that Spencer Strider is going for an MRI. Strider, of course, of the Atlanta Braves. That he's got UCL damage, which typically means Tommy John. They haven't announced that officially yet if the damage is severe enough to go forth with the surgery. But there's really not another way to get it repaired in a reliable way besides having the surgery and being shut down for the year. That's typically what happens. We'll see if that news does come to fruition on Strider. Another one, Shane Bieber of the Guardians, out for the year. Tommy John surgery. Yuri Perez. Phenom for the Marlins. That was announced a couple of days ago. He's having Tommy John. We know Garrett Cole's out for a while. We know that Devin Williams of the Milwaukee Brewers, their lights out closer. He's out for the first half of the season. A lot of prominent pitching injuries already in Major League Baseball. But I think it's notable that one of those names that you're hearing about being down for the count right now is not Steven Matz. Cardinal starter yesterday goes five innings, no runs allowed looking confident, looking healthy, looking strong. And do we need to give the Cardinals a little bit of credit for the way that they slow played his spring training? Even though we thought it was annoying at the time. We're like, why has Steven Matz got to be behind? Why are they taking their time so deliberate with Steven Matz? You know, he's not going to be built up to a pitch count when the season begins. This isn't spring training. This is April baseball. What are they doing having one of their starters on a pitch count? Do you know what that could do to the bullpen? All of those thoughts, I think, were sort of floating around about Steven Matz, and I think valid because it is a little frustrating to have a Cardinal team that comes into the year already down their ace, Sonny Gray. It's going to be back soon, though. But you've got all these things kind of floating around, and you're, you're wanting to get off to a strong start because you want to put last year's rough season behind you. And you knew that last year's rough season came really from it was kind of it evolved from how bad the start was in April. You're like 8 and 19, something like that. And they don't want to do that again. So you want to have all hands on deck to begin the season. With Steven Matz, they slow played his spring. They were very deliberate the way they brought him along. But if you think about Steven Matz, man, he's been a guy that in his past has had injuries that he's dealt with, and the Cardinals haven't gotten the most out of him as a result of that. It's been disappointing here entering year three of the Steven Matz contract that they they just haven't got a lot of production from him. And so the Cardinals said, look, you know what? Having Steven Matz healthy and having him be in a good place when we get to the season, even if that means he can only throw 80, 85, 90 pitches in his first few outings. We're going to take that version of Steven Matz if it means that we have a higher percentage chance of keeping this guy healthy for the long run. And I know it's only been two starts, so you can't just use this as the definitive outcome and say, hey, he's healthy and the Cardinals did it right. I think the Cardinals did do it right because you're seeing a Steven Matz that's locked in right now and, and seems to be in a very good place. Velocity's good. Good mix on his pitches. We'll talk about how he hasn't thrown the curveball as much. Maybe part of a, a bit of a deliberate process there. But the fastball was 94-95 yesterday. Threw it where he, where he wanted to. Located it. Both sides of the plate. Mixed locations. Mixed velocities by mixing in the changeup a fair bit. Steven Matz is in a really good spot. At least he was on... Saturday, and the Cardinals win the game 3-1 to one behind his solid start. Just five innings, so he's not getting super deep into games so far and ended up throwing 85 pitches. Only Marmel was asked about, 
you know, maybe letting him go a little bit longer. What was the thought process there? And he said the pitch count they wanted him to kind of be limited at for this game was about 90. It was 80 the first time out, and he threw 81. This time it was 90, but he was at 85 to finish an inning. And you had batters 2, 3, 4 coming up. And so that was maybe a natural time because, why? you know, unless it's just a perfect matchup, are you going to bring him back out for just one hitter to throw those five pitches? Or can you can you get Steven Matz leaving this game in a good spot, set up your bullpen to succeed? Cardinals had a lead at the time. And just go ahead and, and ride that out and have him feeling good about his first two outings. He's got a 1.74 ERA. He's gotten through five innings in both starts. Hasn't gotten through six in either of them, but he's been on that pitch count, a little bit of a pitch cap. And I think as much as it is valid to say, hey, the Cardinals, the way they're built, they need their starters to go deeper so that they can protect the bullpen and the bullpen can be at its best and not overworked as you get through the season. All those things are true. But I think at its core, when we're talking about that conversation, don't we really mean the Cardinals can't afford to have the two inning outings and the three inning outings that guys like Adam Wainwright were putting together last year? I mean, again, we don't want to beat beat on Adam Wainwright too much, but the way that he just couldn't compete last year at times due to the injury that he was going through, of course. We didn't know it at the time, but he was injured. But that really set the Cardinals back in more ways than what happened on those days of his starts. It was, I think, the cumulative toll that it took on the bullpen that we really also need to pay attention to. When the bullpen's having to cover seven innings in a game, and for a while it felt like they were having to do that every fifth day. He'd go three innings, maybe four. I think there's a difference in saying, well, got to get more out of your starters. That's true. But if it's five, if it's five and a third, and if it's scoreless outings like it was yesterday for Steven Matz, that's a little different. I think the Cardinals can work with that. I don't think you want every single guy in your rotation only going five, but that's why you have a Lance Lynn. Like Lance Lynn, I understand, didn't have a great outing on the home opener, gave up some homers and got knocked out of that game in the fifth. But I think more times than not, you'll see him go six. I think Kyle Gibson more times than not will be able to get through six plus. We'll see what he does on Sunday. But he had seven innings, two runs allowed in his first outing. That's that's really what the Cardinals were were looking for I, with, with the way they constructed this rotation. I know we had you know a lot of folks doubted at the time, and I'm not doing this victory lap on their behalf either. It's nine games into the season. Let's relax. But I do think you're seeing play out the way they envisioned it going when you brought in Lance Lynn, when you brought in Kyle Gibson, to say, hey, these guys might be more toward the back of our rotation, but if they can get us through six-plus uh, and Steven Matz can be good, we don't need Steven Matz to go six-plus every time. He can go five, and those other guys, those veterans that we brought in, are the ones that will pick up the slack for him by going deep. Sonny Gray, you know, we'll see. If he can be a guy that goes goes six-plus, that would be nice. Obviously, he threw a good amount of innings last year, but sometimes used a decent number of pitches to where he wasn't. It's not like he was going seven every time. But Miles Michaelis, too, is a guy that pitches to contact. So if your defense is good, like this is just a math equation. You can kind of see it map out in your head. At least I do. Where if you say, hey, Miles Michaelis threw 200 innings last year, we need him to be an innings eater again this year. So let's put a defense behind him that can allow those 200 innings to go a little more smoothly this time by having a defense that catches the fly balls in the gap, that gobbles up the ground balls that maybe found holes last year. And suddenly, Miles Michaelis isn't a 4 7 eight ERA anymore, right? He's a he's a 4-1 ERA or a 3-9 ERA or perhaps even better than that. Time will tell. But like that's, I think, why the Cardinals felt the way they built their rotation was going to work because they had a, a full-scale process behind it to say, We like these arms in the bullpen. We think we're a little bit more dynamic in the bullpen this year than we were last year. And if you're only asking those guys to go one inning for the most part, they're not going to get burnt out in the way that they did last year. Guys were having to fill innings four, five, six before you could even think about getting to the back end of the bullpen. And then in most cases, the Cardinals were losing by so many runs that it just wasn't, you didn't want to use your main guys at that point. But yesterday, the Cardinals in that fifth inning, Steven Matz gets through it. The Cardinals add on a little bit of insurance at the bottom of the fifth. So there you go. Three nothing. Bullpen, it's up to you. Let's finish this thing. And I love it that Ali Marmol went to Giovanni Gallegos in the sixth. Because he doesn't just it's modern MLB. You don't have to have your quote unquote setup man come in only in the eighth inning. And then your closer in the ninth. I think the closer in the ninth is still going to be pretty typical, especially as saves continues to be a stat that earns guys money in this league. The closers want to be the closers and the modern 
uh, approach to baseball might might differ with that, but I do think that you might see for a while it was, hey, we can use guys anyway, and that's forward thinking, and he doesn't always have to be in the ninth. And I, I, I still think that's true at the end of the day if you're trying to win a ball game. But early in the season, I also think that if you want to manage, and this is the part I think that it's hard for fans to always see through because they're not in that clubhouse, but I think if you want to be a manager that's known for having your players' backs, you also put them in, I'm not going to say the positions they want to be in because you also have to, those positions have to be earned. But in, in the case of a Ryan Helsley, that position has been earned. So that's the guy that comes in in the ninth. I'm talking about nothing here, but I do think it's an interesting conversation on a, on a more helicopter view sort of standpoint. But I like that they, they bring Geo in for that sixth inning because it was a spot in the game where that can get away from you. When you have the, the heart of the Miami lineup coming up to the plate and Josh Bell, Jake Berger, who homered twice on Saturday, or pardon me, on Thursday, Brian De La Cruz. Like, this Miami lineup is not very good. You know, it's why they're 0-9 at this point. That and pitching injuries, of course. But I think if you've got a 2-3-4 coming up and this is a spot where you want to shut down inning after the Cardinals were able to put up some uh, another insurance run in the fifth, that's that's where you go to Geo because he's been, been very good, been locked in. And he throws a scoreless frame. Good to see JoJo Romero as well. Like, people looked at his spring and went, uh-oh, is JoJo really going to be the same guy? Um, so far, so good. He and Gio both with a 1.80 ERA, both with a scoreless frame yesterday. JoJo uh, gave up a hit but struck out a batter. All zeros for Gallegos. Kittredge gave up a run in his eighth inning, and I'm going to basically just write that one off. It happened so quick. It was like a bloop double and then a base hit. It happened within a span of like four pitches, and then he got the double play to erase the the latter base runner and get out of the eighth inning. Um, maybe a little bit of what we talked about with Kyle Gibson of pitching to the score where, yeah, you're, you're going to pound strikes. And if they bloop you or if they get one on you and it's just a solo shot or whatever, that that's something that you can kind of manage when it's, when it's three, nothing or, or five, nothing or whatever the case. Um, when I brought up the, the notion of pitching to the score with Ollie Marmel and asked, you know, what kind of teammate, what kind of veteran does it take to, to recognize that? Yeah. Your ERA might take a little bit of a hit if you pitch that way sometimes, but that over the long run, it can help a team. And he said that's something that Kyle Gibson's been around long enough to know. And Kittredge is another guy who you feel like you're, you're comfortable and confident with him maybe taking that approach at times if there's a certain score that dictates it. So I just thought the Kittredge, he gave up a run. It happened so fast and then had the double play. And, and the double that got the guy in scoring position was a bloop anyway. So not even a concern there. And you had you had a little bit of breathing room. And then Ryan Helsley came in, shut the door, uh, did give, give up a hit. It was off the glove of Mason Wynn. I, I believe it was Wynn at short. But it was deep in the hole. Uh, no error. Still no errors on the season for the Cardinals. But my prediction, I, they're probably going to have an error on Sunday because it got talked about way too much in the postgame. Um, it was very funny. I forget who asked Brendan Donovan about it after the game, but he kind of gave a little bit of a smile and a look like, hey, bro, what are you doing? Like, why Like why would you talk about it? But it, it really is the case that the Cardinals defensively are playing so well right now. And I think it is just a crisper style of play, a cleaner style of play that is conducive to winning. And it's got this team in a, in a good spot, and they're five and four as a result. Like this offense, guys, has not come to fruition yet for the Cardinals the way that you want to see it happen. We can all be honest about that. The offense has been pretty sluggish coming out of the gate for the St. Louis Cardinals this season, but it hasn't really mattered, right? Like think about how close this team would be if they were hitting a little bit, how, how good of a spot they would be in rather than just being five and four. Or maybe if they don't, you know, blow that game against the Dodgers that, you know, it got away from them because of bullpen usage a little bit in that series, as we had talked about. But the Cardinals are five and four, and I mean they're a they're just a hair from being either six and three or seven and two. You can play that game, the what if game, all year long. There are gonna be some that you win that you shouldn't, and some that you that you lose that you shouldn't. And those will go both ways, and the idea would be that they kind of level out at the end of the year. But on the other side of that, you'd also like to be the team that more often than not takes advantage of of those close game situations and, and can do things in the clutch that allow you to win those games. But the Cardinals right now are 22nd in MLB and OPS at 642. You know, that's that's lower than they ranked certainly last year in OPS. They're 17th, tied for 17th in run scored with 38 runs. Um, they played nine games. Some teams have played more. Some teams have played less. But, they're you know, Cardinals are middle of the pack offensively, maybe even a little bit below that if you want to look into OPS, which I, I do like to look at because I think it's a little bit more conducive and predictive of like, what will the run score be moving forward? If this is the the type of on base and slugging percentage you guys are compiling. So 
offensively, they haven't really gotten it going yet. And I don't think it's going to be all year that they have a 640 OPS. I think they're offensively going to be better than they've been. Now, we talked a lot in the preseason about will they be a top 10 offense? Will they be a top five lineup? No, I don't think this is going to be a top five lineup necessarily. But is it fair to draw that conclusion from nine games? I don't know. With guys on the injured list, we're going to see Lars Newbar back here really soon. Played on Saturday in Memphis. He's going to play, and I believe, DH on Sunday in Memphis. And in the minor leagues, they don't play games on Monday. So you could see Lars Newbar back in St. Louis as early as Monday if the Cardinals believe he's gotten enough reps in with the work that he's done over the weekend uh, with Memphis. It's in Indianapolis, not in Memphis. Which, by the way, Pedro Pajes, fun story on KMOV.com that I wrote about his journey to Bush Stadium. He took an Uber. Cardinals literally called him an Uber so that he could get there in the later innings of Thursday's game. And we talked to Pedro Pajes in the Cardinal Clubhouse yesterday about that. So check that out. I might also put some audio from Pajes up on the YouTube channel. YouTube.com slash at bshafer 12 uh, If you're watching this on YouTube now, or listening rather, since it's just a photo with uh, the audio coming through of the podcast, click subscribe in the lower right-hand corner of your screen on YouTube. If you enjoy Cardinals content throughout the season, we'll be bringing it to you. I do apologize that th- this recording is going up a little bit later Sunday morning. I intended to do it before I went to bed on Saturday, as I've done for the last you know week and a half or whatever. We've been pretty consistent on B-Shape Daily. But I was watching the Final Four, and I did the ultimate dad move. I just fell asleep on the couch. And uh, I think that was a sign my body was like, yeah, you need a little bit of rest here after uh, getting it going early in the season. But I, um, I'm i up now and, and doing the podcast. So hopefully you guys enjoy. And hopefully, I mean, we're good. We, lo- we locked in on Steven Matz a lot today. So hopefully this isn't something that's no longer timely after the Sunday uh, game. So I don't know, Cardinals fans, what do you think about Steven Matz and the way that things have started for him? Because... I really like what we're seeing from Steven Matz. I think he's kind of a linchpin key to this rotation. If you can get this type of performance from him consistently, like would it surprise anybody if Steven Matz were able to stay healthy? His, he finishes with 140, 150 innings maybe because he's, he's just not a guy that historically you're going to push innings wise, even in some of his best seasons. And I'll, and I'll look this up now to make sure I'm, I'm presenting this properly. It doesn't seem like to me he's ever been a guy that's gone super deep into games and, and tons of innings. Looking out throughout his career, 160 and a third is his career high. And in Toronto, when he had a really solid, solid season, a 3.82 ERA the year before the Cardinals signed him, 150 innings. He's had a, a couple seasons of 150, one of 130, and then that 160 season that I mentioned. And after that, it's been injury riddled seasons for the most part for Steven Matz. So. You don't need this to be a guy that goes 180 on the season. You need 140, 150 good innings out of Steven Matz. I wouldn't be surprised, again, if he stays healthy. That's always going to be the caveat. But if Steven Matz had a season where he goes 140 innings, which ranks fifth on your starting rotation if nobody is lost for a significant time, because I think everybody else on the rotation is capable of just grinding out, getting deeper into games. But he might be low ERA on the team. Or, you know, second in the rotation in ERA behind maybe like a Sonny Gray. I Steven Matz had a 3.86 ERA last year. Last year, the year that was just pitiful for the Cardinals. He had a sub-4 ERA. I don't know if people completely realize that because of how rough his start was and the fact that he got injured to end the season. But everything that happened in between, once he got taken from, like they put him in the bullpen, and I think that was a bit of a wake-up call for Steven Matz where he had to kind of put on his game face and have that bulldog mentality and say, I can do this and I want another crack at this rotation. It's what y'all signed me to do. I want another shot at it, and I'm going to have the mentality to back that. And ever since, when they put him back in the rotation, he was that guy and and took his ERA from like 6 down to 3.86 on the campaign and had over 100 innings. You just want it to be a little more consistent. Steven Matz was like a roller coaster last year, way down, then way up, and then you go way down when, when you're injured at the end. The Cardinals just want to see steadiness, I think, from Steven Matz. And through through two, you know, two starts, knock on wood, that's kind of what they've gotten from him so far. And that's kind of fun. That's exciting, I think, to see that Steven Matz might be a factor in this rotation in that way. And the way the Cardinals brought him along in spring, I really do think is something we can credit them for. Not because it's over. Because they still, I think, are going to have to continue to manage him. Just because, not because he's just this, you know, this soft dude that you you just need to wear the kid gloves with. 
it's not it's not really the way I think I would characterize it. I just think at this point, can you say, hey, it is what it is. This guy has had some really good moments, some some bright spots that he's flashed, but he hasn't been available. And so if we need to, to take some extra care to make sure he's available and and just be communicative and know his body and 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 listen to, you know, if that's what we got to do, isn't it worth it for Steven Matz to, to get the production that you could get from him as a result? Here was Ollie Marmel asked post-game, I believe KD asked the question, as it pertains to the slow play, the deliberate pacing of Steven Matz in spring, and how that could be paying dividends for the Cardinals now. Yeah, we've talked about it quite a bit. April's a tough month for pitchers, and that's where you see the majority of injuries. Um, so we just want to make sure we're taking care of our guys, and he's one of them. Um, so taking him to right around that 85-90 today was, was good, and we'll build off of that his next time out. But he did his job within that pitch count for sure. Cardinal manager Ali Marmel on Steven Matz. He goes 85 pitches on Saturday, I believe 56 strikes. It's either 56 or 59 because a nine kind of looks like a six upside down. It was 56. You know, you ever notice that, though? The number kind of does look the same if you flip it. And so maybe in my head I had thought it was one, but it was the other. Anyway, 56 strikes for Steven Matz on 85 pitches. He threw 81 the first time, 85 this time. They were willing to have him go to 90 again. I just think it was a case of it made sense at that point to to get him through and go to the bullpen, turn it over to those guys who ended up throwing really well. Four innings, one run allowed by that bullpen, and you are in the midst of a, of a longer homestand now where there's not going to be an off day. You're going to play Monday. Phillies are coming to town, so we'll see what it ends up looking like bullpen-wise for who's available for the Cardinals. Geo threw 20 pitches in his inning. It was 16 for JoJo, 13 for Kittredge. Um, so I would bet Kittredge probably available. We haven't seen Libby in a minute, although he's been warming up a lot. Jeff Jones has turned me on to that, that he's just been – They've been warming him up, and he hasn't come into games, and he's just got the rubber arm, I guess, is sort of the thought there. But Ryan Helsley only needed six pitches again in the ninth inning. This is, I believe, the second save where he threw only six pitches. Ryan Helsley is going to have an incredible year if this pacing continues because I know that there's this notion of, like, can he go back-to-backs? Can he go multiple innings? I think it's got to be one or the other. I really do think that's the case. When you've got a guy that throws 100, I know the fan mentality is going to be, Hey, we just you just need to be available for your team. You just need to be able to get out there. I think it's best, in the same way we're talking about Steven Matz, I think it's honestly best. And I don't know if this was always my take. You might have been able to go back a couple of years and and say, gotcha, Brendan, you're you're contradicting yourself. I don't know. You'd have to go back and look. I've been when you when you put out as many words into the ether as I have over the years talking Cardinal baseball, right in Cardinal baseball, then maybe that's liable to happen. But my take now is looking around the league at these guys that are getting injured. The dynamic arms, Devin Williams. And it wasn't an arm issue for Devin Williams. It was something with the back. So it's not that, you know, maybe apples to apples. But when you've got a dynamic guy like Ryan Helsley and he can throw 100 and he can be a lockdown closer, not just in 2022 when he was an all-star and had like a one ERA. Go back and look last year. His numbers were ridiculous last year as well. He just wasn't always healthy and available. He had some time on the injured list, but the ERA was still in like the low to mid twos. He was really good. Ridiculous K rate. All of it. If you've got a guy like that, knowing how easy it is to lose pitchers to injury in modern baseball, especially when they throw as hard as Ryan Helsley does, I want to see that guy available, and I'm okay with the Cardinals managing it a little bit more. I know it's not an old-school mentality. I know some old-school baseball fans that listen to this podcast are probably rolling their eyes right now, and I respect that. But I do think with the modern advances and the focus on spin rate and all of the things that are happening, they're asking a lot on these elbows. They're asking a lot of these pitchers' arms and the torque and the – it's not a natural motion physically, and that's why a lot of these injuries do happen. I'm I'm good with having Ryan Helsley. If he's going back-to-back, back, you, can't, you can't do up-downs with him. Don't do the multiple innings thing. Sparingly, you know, if you're going to – I think it's the best thing for the Cardinals to make sure they've got him. And then if you get into the playoffs – Ryan Helsley's going to want that ball every night. I know Cardinals fans don't believe me about this because of the the sad way that 2022 ended, but they were ready to ride the rail with with Ryan Helsley in that playoff series. He he nicked up his finger on a comebacker in Pittsburgh on a Tuesday, and the thing went numb on him in the second inning of a. They were using him the way Cardinals fans wanted to see him used. He got the the last out in the eighth or whatever it was. He came out for the ninth. It it got numb on him. 
and the rest is history. But the Cardinals said they won that game in the series. You were going to see Ryan Helsley used pretty heavily. That's Ollie Marmel has said that. I've heard him with his with my own ears that he said, "Look, we we took care of him, and then we were going to try and win a World Series with him." I know people were, you know, I know what the temperature is on Ollie Marmel throughout Cardinal Nation because of what happened last year. I would just ask you to take a moment, take a brief moment, and think about it this way. Last year, and maybe some still feel this way, I can't tell you how many comments I got about how great Skip Schumacher is and how bad Ollie Marmel is. Just notice right now that the Marlins still haven't won a game. They're 0-9. Do you blame Skip Schumacher for that? Do I? I certainly do not. Look at the lineup for the Marlins. Look at the pitching that they're putting out there. It's just it's just a little bit substandard. It's not That's not the roster they had last year. I don't think they're going to go 0 and 162, but I also don't think the Marlins are a competitive team for a playoff push this year. But Skip won manager of the year last year in the National League, and he deserved it. But now his team's 0 and 9. Does that mean he suddenly stinks as a manager? No. Skip Schumacher's got a bright future in MLB managing. I also believe that Ali Marmel does. I know that you're a little close to it because of what happened last year, and it was a long year, and nobody looks smart. No manager is going to look smart going 71 and 91. Not Tony La Russa, not Mike Schilt, and not Ollie Marmel. Mike Matheny would not have looked smart doing it either. He didn't look smart sometimes winning 90 games. Anyway, I just wanted to put that in there I'm because I know people get irritated with my stance on Ollie. It's been consistent that he's a good manager. It, if the Cardinals win a bunch of games this year, are you still going to hate Ollie Marmel? I don't know. I don't think you should. But I also look at it and say, I know you guys love Skip Schumacher. I have seen so many comments about, ah, they should have hired Skip. Well, Skip's got a team now that's 0-9. The reason I, I bring this up is not to say, hey, Skip stinks. See, I told you so. No, 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 no. Skip's good. I think Ollie's good. I think it just shows that there are things happening for baseball teams besides the, the field manager that can impact whether they win games or they don't win games. But... I look at the handling so far of the bullpen outside of, again, we're going to nitpick sometimes. That's what we do. If we talk Cardinals every single day throughout a season, we're going to say, yeah, we don't agree with what Ollie did here. And if it's a home game in particular, I'm going to ask him about it because that's the benefit of, you know, giving the guy, okay, hey, we didn't, on the surface, we didn't think this one made sense. What were you seeing there? And then we might be able to learn something about the thought process. And at the end of the day, we still might disagree with it. But that that's typically what what we'd want to have. Of course, when I was kind of nitpicking last week, they were on the road and I wasn't out there. But if something like that happens at home, the good news is I'll, I'll be around for those conversations to, to say, hey, here's what they were thinking. Now do we agree or disagree after hearing the, the result of that? And that's, that's honestly the way that Ollie Marmel has told me he believes it should work as well. He's amenable to understanding that there's criticism out there. And, and you know he embraces that in a lot of ways. I've talked a lot about Ollie here. I know that that was not really the topic of conversation of the day, but I just think the du- the juxtaposition is a little bit interesting with the Cardinals playing the Marlins right now. The Cardinals taking it to Miami a little bit does not mean that Skip Schumacher is a bad manager. In, in, in the same way that I don't think one season for Ollie of, of a roster that just had the bottom drop out of it uh, indicates what his future in this business is going to be. This is my thoughts. Let me know, Cardinals fans, what you think in the comments below. I know I'm kind of asking for trouble a little bit, specifically requesting comments about Ollie because you you typically give them to me whether I ask for them or not. But that's your right. I appreciate you guys out there. The passion, I say it over and over and over again. Talked about this on Low Hanging Fruit with Charlie Marlowe on Friday, uh, which go go listen to that on his YouTube channel or over on the B-Shape Daily Spotify feed. Um, Spotify numbers are going up. I really appreciate you guys who have gone to your Spotify uh, app on your phone and typed in B-Shape Daily and typed follow and then typed five-star review. Because I get those numbers and I see that, that we're getting more followers over there, which is really cool. But go listen to that uh, with Charlie Marlowe, Low Hanging Fruit. We talked for like an hour on Friday about the first week for the Cardinals. And that came up a little bit where I said, look, I love the passion of Cardinals fans because we don't have podcasts. <laughs> if if not for Cardinals fans, loving this damn team, win, lose, or draw. And you can only draw in spring training. And the Cardinals did a lot of that <laughs> in spring training. But we're having fun here. Cardinals are they're winning. You know, they've got a 5-4 and four record. Hopefully, they're able to win on Sunday and and maybe pad that a little bit more so they can never look back to a, to a season where they were below 500 for basically the full year. But let me know your temperature right now, Cardinals fans. How you feeling about the team? How you feeling about that rotation? I think there's a chance this rotation 
And look, I know I said preseason that top 12 was probably my upper limit for what they could do. But if you get Sonny Gray back and he's good and the rest of these guys kind of go status quo for what they've been, maybe you do kind of find a way to wedge into the top 10. Again, I still think that's the very, very, very upper limit because the bottom can still drop out. You can have some guys have some bad days and suddenly you're looking at it differently. But the rotation's been sturdy. The bullpen's been really nice. I know there were a few moments in that Dodgers series that's probably still weighing down the ERA, but 3.73 bullpen ERA, that's 13th in baseball. So again, like I said, maybe not quite as robust as it would seem with the credit that we're giving. But I think that's still pretty solid considering you got through that Dodgers series relatively unscathed. You really wish you could have split the series. You lose three of four, and the bullpen ERA definitely took a took a hit in that series, but they've been really pretty good since. And I think when you look in that bullpen, you're not looking at anybody going, uh-oh, like this guy's really struggling. I think everybody's kind of in a decent spot, decent to good to great, however you you couch it. And then we saw even Ryan Fernandez with that three strikeout appearance the other day. Maybe he's somebody that has some more juice than we might we might necessarily think. So let me know, Cardinals fans, in the comments below how you're feeling. Make sure to give a like to this video. Love when you guys do that. And hit that subscribe button if you enjoy Cardinals content on a daily basis throughout the season. That's going to do it, though, for this edition of the show. Appreciate you guys, as always. And we'll talk to you next time on Be Shafe Daily. Peace.